In our, our Sunday morning's uh, studies, we've been uh, looking at the little book of James, and uh, we've been talking about his theme is that, that you have a faith that works. That it's not just talk, but it actually shows up in your life. And so we're looking at this whole thing. And today we're going to uh, look at a faith that works when you're confused by the world. Uh, as Christians, we kind of live countercultural. Uh, the whole world seems to be going in one direction, and we seem to be going counter that. And sometimes we just feel like we're swimming upstream. We're going against the current of everything in our society. And it takes a strong faith to do that. It really does. It takes a strong faith. <clears throat> I want to tell you a story. You don't recognize this building. Um, few people do because I, I pastored this. This was my first church. I, I started pastoring at 27 years old. And uh, I think I was like the youngest guy in the church at the time. And, <laughs> and, and I, was, I was pastor. And I was as green as they come. And, and I had really no idea what I was doing. There, there's something to be said for a uh, seasoned preacher. And uh, uh, Jay Adams, in uh, one of his works, I think it's called Shepherding God, says uh, when you, you're first pastorate, you get bombarded with all the weirdest things in the world. God's just preparing you for the rest of your ministry. <laughs> it's like baptism by fire. And uh, it, 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 it was true. It happened to me. I had more unusual things happen in my first year of pastoring uh, than in the rest of my ministry probably combined. God was just preparing me for what would uh, lie ahead. And one of the interesting things is that I became the envy of the neighbor. You notice I crossed off hood? And it wasn't the whole neighborhood. But I was the envy of, of, of the neighbor, of a neighbor. And uh, I, I got to back up just a little bit and, and tell you the story here. Um, it was in the day when we, we didn't have digital phones and all of that, so I had an analog tape recording message system in my office, and I would receive, people would leave a message on it. When I go in, I'd hit the button, rewind, and play back the message. Remember those days, right? And so I went in one day, and I looked, and my tape was completely full. Completely full. An hour tape. Well, it would go off every two minutes. So that meant I had a lot of people call me, but when I backed it up and started playing it, it was the same person calling me. <laughs> and they would go until the beep would ring, hang up, redial, and pick up right where they left off. <laughs> so it was like an hour crying out for help. I didn't know this person. This person in the neighborhood. So this next Sunday, I'm up to speak. And I'm preaching, and just about to preach, I should say. All of a sudden, the auditorium's laid out just like this. Main doors right in the back. Everybody is seated. All of a sudden, crashing through those doors, comes the neighbor. Only thing is, she's in a nightgown. She's stiff walking. Her eyes are rolling around in her head. She comes about halfway and lays down in the middle of the floor. Needless to say, my message was shot. <laughs> the attention was all focused on this. Now, fortunately, sitting right across the aisle from where she laid down were two off-duty Philadelphia police officers who knew exactly what to do. <laughs> they jumped right out, scooped her up, hauled her out, took her home. <laughs> And I stood there kind of dumbfounded. How am I going to salvage a service that's just about to start? And I believe the Holy Spirit prompted me. Because I said to the congregation, this is one of our neighbors, she came today to get help. She came today to get help. Said, I don't know if I, got, if I can help her, but I said, I've, uh, I know some really well-trained counselors uh, at the Christian Education, uh, Christian Counseling Educational Foundation. And uh, I'm going to just tell you right now, I'm recommending to the deacons to spend the benevolent fund to pay for her counseling. And so they agreed immediately, oh yeah, we'll, we'll pay for it. So what we did is <clears throat> I, they didn't, she, she didn't have a car, they didn't have a car. So I volunteered to use the church van because I wanted several seats between me, the driver, 
<laughs> and this woman in the car, and I also invited one of the deaconesses to come along, and she sat with her in the seat so that she, I, I could get her to counseling, and we did. We went to the Christian Counseling Educational Foundation, and I took her in, and we filled out the paperwork, and it was my instructor for counseling that wound up to be the counselor. Perfect. I sat down. I'm confident he's going to do a great job. She goes in the room. A few minutes, he comes out and says, whoa, what are you doing out here? Come on in. I want you in here with me. <laughs> and so I go in, <clears throat> and I'm seated with her. And she's in one chair, and I'm in the other. And he starts counseling with her. And he doesn't, you know, the tool of a counselor is they ask questions. Kind of like your doctor. You know, your doctor first thing says, well, what's your problem? Well, you say, well, this is my problem. Well, this particular patient didn't really know what her problem is. So he's, <clears throat> he's asking questions. And he gets to about his third question. She lunges out of her seat and flops on the floor. Just like she did at church. So I knew what those guys did. I jump up to get her out of the floor, get her back into her seat. And the counselor points his finger at me and says, don't touch her. I'm st- okay. I get back in my chair. He rolls his chair around, counsels her, laying on the floor. She just lay there and he started pulling out Bible verses and talking to her very calmly and, and, and everything. And then as soon as the time was up, he said, oh, time's up. You can get up now. And he rolled around. She got up and walked out. <laughs> on the way out, he pulled me by the arm. He said, where did you find her? <laughs> I said, I didn't fight her. She found me. <laughs> he said, listen, they don't, they don't let these kind on the street anymore. You, they go to the hospital and then they put them on drugs so that they can't have weird behavior like this. They, they just drug them up. He said, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought her here. <clears throat> so every week, <clears throat> it was like Monday, every Monday, we prayed for this lady at church, a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, prayed for her on Sundays, but every Monday... <clears throat> The other woman helped me get her to the counseling uh, center and second time there, got about 10 minutes into it, boom, lunged on the floor and I just sat back. I know, I just sit here. I know what he's going to do. He's going to roll around and talk to her. (laughs) He did. Third week, got about a half hour into it. Fourth week, got about three quarters of the way through it. Fifth week, just before she's about to leave, she lunges in the floor. She says, oh, time's up. You can get up now. And she did. (laughs) After that, she quit lunging in the floor. <clears throat> but the counselor who had been my instructor in counseling had told me, he said, I want you to learn from this. I want you, me, to be, that's why you wanted me in every session. And, uh, and I watched him take the word of God, this book, the word of God, and explore with her in her life and, and ask her questions, find verses, give Bible assignments, reading the scripture assignments, uh, and things to do. And, and, and it was an extreme learning experience for me. <clears throat> and and she, was, she was required to start coming to church. Not immediately, but to start coming to church. And she would get dressed and come to church. And uh, she, she would sit in the pew. The one time I took her back and, and a neighbor came out to the car. It was church van. And the, and the neighbor said, what are you doing to her? I said, what do you mean what am I doing to her? He said, well, whatever it is, keep doing it. It's working. <laughs> he said, there have been days in a row where she screamed 24 hours a day. Now, now the counselor, he was baffled by what's going on with this woman. He's, so I'm totally baffled. and He's supposed to be the expert. I'm just the, you know, greenhorn pastor. What do I know? And uh, so he's totally baffled. And, and he's probing and he, he's f- trying to find out, is she demon-possessed? Demon-possessed. Because she's got all the signs, but there's none of the, the history and the talk that was associated with it. And he works through all of that. And, and finally, the one day, he comes up with this passage. And uh, I got to tell you, she was, she was envious. He boils down to the passage we're going to look at today. He uses that her to radically change her life. And the heart of everything is she had envy, deep-seated, bitter envy in her heart. And of all people, she was envious of me 
this 27-year-old kid that's got this beautiful, fine-looking automobile. <laughs> that's what came out. She was envious of me because I was young and I had a good job. And her husband, who was a World War II vet, and uh, he, he, had, he didn't have a good job. They didn't have a car. I had this beautiful car. Now, you remember, I told you, this is the one I'm driving along and the hood opened up on me, right? And this is the one I'm telling you that I had to get out on top of it and jump up and down to shut it. Hey, this is the one I told you that when I went to the bank and they said, hey, there's a car in the parking lot that's on fire. Yeah, that was my car. She's envious of this car. Hey, this is the one in the wintertime when I went to open the back hatch that I pulled the whole thing off because it was so cold and brittle. It just ripped right off. She's envious. See what this goes to say. Envy. It doesn't have to be that you're a billionaire for somebody to be envious of you. Envy. Envy is just that bitter attitude towards someone who has something more than you and you want what they have or be what they are. She was uh, so envious. He says uh, in the text, this is the text that the counselor came up with that started working in her life. He said, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, he says this, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Don't deny that it's there. You, you need to acknowledge it, confess it, get that out there, deal with it. He says, such wisdom, such wisdom. There are different kinds of wisdom. And I want to just set two kinds of wisdoms before you today. Two kinds. There is a wisdom that is from above, and I call that book smart. God has inspired this book. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. This is God's wisdom from above. So there is a wisdom that's based on the word of God, and I call that being book smart. Bible book smart. You know the word, you believe the word, you live the word. There's another kind of wisdom I call from below. That's what the text is going to call it. <clears throat> it's earthly. I call that street smart. I've just picked up all the stuff on the street here on earth. I haven't been in connection with God. I'm street smart. I don't, I don't need the book. And so I'm just street smart. I, I haven't been disciplined in the word of God, so I have no idea what God has to say, but I, I've lived life. I'm street smart. All right? And so we got these two wisdoms. Now, now wisdom is different from knowledge. Knowledge is to know something. I can know the Bible and not be wise. I, I, I can know as a scientist the facts and still not be wise. Wisdom is the ability to know how to use what you know. A wise person knows how to use the book. A wise person knows how to use science. A wise person knows the apt words to say at any given time. The wise person knows how to use the truth. There are two kinds in this passage. Such wisdom, he says, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly. There is a wisdom that is just worldly. It's just horizontal and plain. The next word is unspiritual. Spiritually dead. The real word here is soulish. The word soul has to do with your horizontal plane, your spirit has to do with your vertical plane. This person has no vertical connection. Their knowledge, their, their, their wisdom has no vertical connection at all. They live selfishly for themselves. And then he says, of the devil. Of the devil. Literally, the Greek text says, it is demon-like. It's not the devil. It's not demonic, it's not demon possession, but it's demon-like. It acts like the devil. And that's what the counselor came up with. He said, she's acting as if she were demon-possessed, but she's never actually invited a demon into her life. 
what she has is envy, such a bitter envy in her heart that she sows all the symptoms of someone who would be demon-possessed. Her envy gripped her. It overtook her. It influenced everything she was doing. I see here an unholy threesome. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Those three things pop up a lot. They're all in opposition to God. These things are going on. Wisdom from the earth does not glorify God. Why is wisdom earthly and spiritual of the devil? Well, he says here, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. This gal had disorder in her life. She couldn't sleep. She had scars on her hands. From holding her cigarette, not smoking it, just letting it burn all the way down, burn her fingers and all the way through until it would drop off. There's disorder here, folks. Huge disorder. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. You have emotional disorder. You don't feel right. You're all consumed with envy. You have intellectual disorder. You see the world incorrectly. Come on, my car was not something. There's a car in the parking lot right next to it was a Mercedes. <laughs> Why she picked mine over that one, I have no idea. You're just not intellectually stable. Now, listen, physical disorder. I just described it. She burned herself. Listen, marital disorder. Family disorder. We go down the list. Social disorder. You don't fit in. Work disorder. Look at it. a financial disorder. There's all kinds. Of, it's total dysfunction. When you, let, when you let bitter envy take over your heart, when you become envious of someone who has something more or better or they do something better, whatever it is, what makes you envious, you invite disorder and dysfunction into your life. You just invited it. So much for the wisdom that's from below. Now, let's look at such wisdom that's from above. Because that's what the text says. But, the wisdom that comes from heaven, different source, it's not horizontal, it's vertical. It's not dead, unspiritual, it's alive, it's spiritual. The wisdom that comes from heaven looks so much different. It is, first of all, pure. It's not clouded with misjudgment. It's not clouded with terrible emotions. It's not, it's pure. It's not been poisoned so that when you partake of it, it starts its ill effects on you. It's pure. When God gives you wisdom, it's pure. It is a pure thing. Then he says, it is peace-loving. It loves peace, tranquility. There is calm. There's no restlessness. There's no worry. There's no agitation. God's wisdom, <clears throat> no matter what the storm around you is going on, you're tranquil, you're peace. You know he's in absolute control. There's no need to be envious. I mean, if he can... If he can clothe the, all the, the flowers of the, of the valley, and he certainly can take care of my clothing. If he can feed all the birds, certainly he can feed me. It, it, you see, I have a peace, and, and I, I seek the peace rather than all that agitation. He says, then it is considerate. In the Greek text, it's uh, actually very gentle and lenient. Um, it's approachable, it's soft. Um, it's not harsh or unkind. It's gentle. God's wisdom brings these things about. It's submissive. Uh, one of the commentaries I read on this, said, uh, the, this word here chosen for submissive is actually the concept of a person who's open to reason. Their mind is not closed. 
It used to be that liberal thought meant you're totally open to everything. Everything's turned around, upside down in our world. Today, liberal thought is closed-minded. You've got to believe my way. Anything else is wrong. Skip the, the liberal thought. Skip the conservative thought. We're talking Christian thought. Christian thought. When we have wisdom from, that's a, from above, we're open-minded. We can listen to the story of the person who's opposed to us and figure out why they're that way. And when they're all done and they've exhausted their story, we can tell them about Jesus. That'll solve their problem. <laughs> Isn't that right? They say, hey, how's that working out for you? <laughs> let, let me tell you how it will work out for you if you have Jesus. You see, I, I have this open to reason where I, I can talk with the other person. That's the kind of wisdom that comes from above. It comes from above. Full of mercy. The word mercy is pity, compassion. Uh, mercy is withholding from someone what they truly deserve. It's being moved deep inside. Uh, having compassion and full of good fruit. Paul will call this the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. Uh, he ends up with self-control, that I can control myself. I can control my emotions. I can control my envy. I can control my anger. I can control all of my emotions. This comes from above. You're not going to get that in this world. That's why it was so important to me that I take this lady to a Christian counselor. Because the Bible and the Word of God with the Spirit of God can bring the wisdom of God that uh, the world doesn't even know. Doesn't even know. Because they're all on a horizontal, horizontal le level. It's impartial. It's not a respecter of persons. That's what he's been talking about earlier in James. We don't judge the book by the cover. We, we don't look at the person... When she came crashing through those doors, we could have written her off. This is, we got to get, get, get rid of this person. This was a cry for help. And so we have to move with compassion, being impartial, giving her the help that we would give anyone else who cried out to us for help. And sincere, genuine, and real. He said, the wisdom that comes from above, you're a peacemaker. <laughs> A peacemaker. You make peace. In the trail of where you've been, um, people have been reconciled. Uh, people have been restored in the relationships. Because what you have done, you have taken conflict and you've brought peace. Because you have the gift from God of wisdom that comes from above. You're able to help people. Peacemakers who sow in peace and they raise a harvest of righteousness. Now I got a big harvest there, okay? <laughs> I, I'm surprised in this passage that he doesn't say that you reap a harvest of peace. He doesn't say that. When I sow peace and, and, and I got, I'm connected with the Spirit of God and God and and, and I've got this wisdom that's coming from above and I'm sowing peace. Behind me follows righteousness. Because when you do right, even if you don't feel like doing what is right, later you will feel peace for having done what was right. You, you saw in your trail is things, things get straightened out. They're correct, they're right. And peace is associated with that. So how does this all work? How does this all work? Well, you need to get smart. Uh, I mean, book smart. <laughs> you gotta get, we got to be book smart. I've got to know the word. And then, and then once I know the word, the verse I skipped was verse 13. Who is wise? I won't put it in there, book wise. Text doesn't say that. I'm saying that. you got... Who is book-wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life. You know what he's saying? You live it. 
If I know it, I got to show it. If I believe it, I've got to live it. He says, I get book smart. Let him show it in a good life and by deeds done, not with arrogance. Uh, Aha, look what I've done. Wait, look, look, boy. I'm pretty good compared to this other person. And, and then I, no. With deep humility, but for the grace of God, so I would go to. With great humility. That comes from wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom from above. I've got to be connected above. Remember my neighbor? Um, after the 12th week, counseling sessions were over. 12 weeks. She had homework assignments. She was doing them. I was following up on them. The other lady that was helping me as a deaconess, she was following up on them. It just so happened that that, that following Sunday night, we had a good old-fashioned hymn sing. Anybody know what a hymn sing is? Where you come to church and you just sing hymns and people call out their favorite hymn song and out of the book and the player, piano player plays it and everybody sings it together. She came in, sat on the front row, and she called out her favorite number. I wish I could remember which one it was, whether it was Amazing Grace or How Great Thou Art or whatever it was. When at testimony time, she stood up. She gave a testimony. I wish I could remember all the details of it. I, I, I can't. You know, it was so, so long ago. But um, she's no longer alive. She was older at the time than I, I, I was, and she, she's gone on. I believe she's with the Lord, you know, because of the radical change in her life that comes from a wisdom that's from above. From above. We need to be connected with that kind of wisdom. How about you? Where's your wisdom? Are you sure just on a horizontal plane? Are you in the Word every day and saying, God, speak to me. Um, cause me to understand. Give me a wisdom that's from above so that I can have all these wonderful attributes, peace, loving, gentleness, all these things that we've talked about. I can have tranquility and peace in my heart. Um, I can be the a peacemaker and solve problems. I don't know about you, but that's the one I want to be. Book smart. Book wise. Connected with the living God. You get this from good, a good life by deeds done in humility as you align yourself up with Scripture and the Word of God. And I'm saying it's a faith that works. And it will work for you when you make your faith, put it into action. Believe it and live it. Don't just say it, do it. You can, you can have a wisdom from a, that's, that's from above. You can. My father, oh, William Henderson, was not the most educated man in the world. Both my brother and I exceeded him in our education. He had high school, graduation certificate, but he's one of the wisest men I've ever met in my whole life. He knew how to use the knowledge he had my dad was connected with God. He didn't pray long and lofty prayers. He prayed real simple. I can remember when he said, Lord, I know that you can if you want to. <laughs> it was pretty simple. The request, he said, Lord, I know that you can if you want to. That's a, it was just a simple way of saying, let thy will be done. Let thy will be done. Wisdom is knowing how to use the word you do know. And then doing it in your life. You'll begin to see that trail of righteousness following behind you wherever you go. You will be the peacemaker. You'll have tranquility. My invitation to you today is do it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, give us the grace today to not just be a hearer of the word, but the doer. To connect with the word of God and seek wisdom that is from above so that we know how to apply the things we know from the word and live them out in our lives so that we have the peace and tranquility. We're peacemakers. We're sincere, impartial. Lord, that there is a path of righteous good deeds that follow in our train. All for the glory of Jesus. 
Make us a people like that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.